Cunningham. I'm Sam Brungo. Today we have Trace McSorley on the show. Very good conversation ahead. What'd you think, Sam? Yeah, awesome conversation. He stayed with us longer than he was expecting, but we had a lot of stuff to talk about. Just got lost in our eyes. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, Me and Pegs at least are, uh, we're big fans of the team at that point. I know you were as well, big Penn State football fan at that point, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, (laughs) So it was cool to talk to him. Um, obviously, as I just mentioned, Will Pegler joined me and Grace for that conversation. Um, before we start, I know one of the headlines is probably this, but a friend of the show, Pat Chambers, just got hired at Florida Gulf Coast. So I'm repping his um, shirt today. Not his shirt, he but... He sent it to you. Yeah, he sent it to me. That's it wasn't so nice. the one he got stabbed. Oh, yeah, I was going to say. Covered in blood. That's in that. a bag in his yeah. office. This also one was in a bag next to that one. The, yeah. And then he was like, Sam needs this. He was like, this. I need to send that to the Podrid Steak crew. Yeah. Um, also wearing Drew Freiberg's jersey. Big NIT Princeton tonight. Anyone check the score on that real quick? I'll do it. Um, soon to be friend of the show. Oh, they're down by three. Um, soon to be friend of the show, Drew Freiberg. Um, anyways, we're going to get into some headlines. Um, Charlie's going to come sit, host some headlines with the crew. All right. Now we're going to get into some headlines. I have Charlie Pegler joining me to host headlines. How How are you, Charlie? Oh, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm pretty good. Is this your first headline hosting i believe so i think wow. so yeah how was what your break it was pretty good how was yours yeah, it was all right boring nice. but it's a good time nice yeah. now we have um <laughs> <laughs> jordan mansberger joining us to read a headline how are you jordan i'm good grace how are you i'm good charlie how, was... how are you i'm doing all right how are you jordy i'm fantastic brother everyone's I'm so vertical. good Hell yeah. You're vertical. yeah it was so nice i'm on one there. why like the weather huh the weather was so nice. yeah dude i had the ac on uh in my truck on the way over Wow. That's pretty soft. Right? You're oh, supposed to just have the windows open at this well, point. I, I don't like driving with the windows down. Why? It, I don't know. It just like messes, it messes with me. messes up your hair? Yeah, it messes up my long hair. That's understandable. Okay, we're already off the rails. <laughs> uh, so, yes, <laughs> start. this started yesterday. Penn State removed the masking requirement, but uh, will continue enforcing them inside classrooms, labs, and other academic and creative spaces at all campuses. The policy change should remove mask requirements for dining halls, on-campus gyms, marketplaces, sporting events, and classrooms used for extracurricular activities. Masks will still be required where they are mandated by law, including particular workplaces, public transportation services, or healthcare settings. It felt so weird. It's a little weird. Yeah. yeah. It was weird at our, our Onward State meeting yesterday. Oh, yeah. We all could, like, see each other. Yeah, it's, like, it's nice to, like, be able to walk around without one, but then you walk into a classroom, you all put them on, and then the second you leave, they're all off. Yeah, it doesn't really make well, sense. Yeah. Then, but, but yeah, plus you okay. realize now, like, I, I've seen a lot of people now for, like, the first time, like, this section of their face. A lot people of people, a little ugly, Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> little ugly. <laughs> the mask definitely played to my favor, I yeah. feel like. No, dude, you're handsome. Come on. Ah, you were mask fishing? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, T's and P's to the mass mandate. Um, really going to miss you, mass mandate. R.I.P. You helped us a lot. Now joining us, we have Shannon Smith. Shannon, how are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm all right. Not as good as I was like five minutes ago. Why? Yeah. Okay. Because um, Shannon's here now? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> My break was good. Thanks for asking. Oh, yeah. How was your break? <laughs> it was good. I got a new car. Oh, really? Wait, really? Yep. What kind? Oh, nice. A Jeep Grand Cherokee. Uh, it's red, right? Yeah, her name's Brittany. She's got black rims. She's nice. Okay. The worst. Wait, what um, was the other one called? Dixie. Oh, yeah. T's and P's for Dixie. T's and P's for Dixie. Okay. Um, on Monday, students strolling into Sabaros might have noticed a new cow and cookie stand that was seemingly set up over spring break. According to signs throughout the hub, the new stand figures to serve treats as a partnership between the Berkey Creamery and the Penn State Bakery. For now, it's unclear exactly when cow and cookie will open, although signs around the hub say it's coming soon. That's fun. Love cookies, love ice cream. So 
But I like, like, I like how it's called cow and cookie. I think that's yeah, funny. Yeah, that's, that's funny. But what are they gonna do? I feel like they would just have like the cookie sandwiches. What else could they do? Maybe. What do you mean? You like the that? one where it's like the cookie, the cookie, and the ice cream, like an ice cream think, sandwich. But isn't it just gonna be like ice cream and cookies? It's they really sell good. them in I like the markets. The market. Yeah. They Sometimes do. when they I'm do. depressed, I go get them. That's good. That Except and the cake. Now I'm on a oh, that's it. Hard, All right, oh. see you, Shannon. Yeah, I'm on a hard <laughs> diet. You Shannon got up so abruptly. Shannon. Bye, Shannon. Life. Now we have Haley Stutzman joining us. Haley, how are you? Oh, I'm great. Grace, how are you? I'm pretty good. How was your break? It was fun. I went to the shore, New Jersey. Nice. nice. You know what? I just learned from my fellow New Jersey residents. I have no idea. After visiting New Jersey, like every year, you don't make left turns. What? When? You don't make left turns is what they tell me. They live in Tom's. Ever? They, they live in I Tom's make left River. Turns. Really good at literally. <laughs> Todd Frazier. No. Yeah. Like it's like jug handles. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you like the circles. Yeah. Yeah, but I make left turns like, like well, sometimes. Well, live in a small town, but like. Yeah, I'm, like on one of those. That's it's like so busy. Weird. I thought you meant ever. I, I was like, I actually didn't. I was no, like, am they, I doing something illegal? They told me they never make left turns. Well, I like down the shore. They live in like Tom's they River, live. like seaside. Yeah, I guess. That's interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay, so. <laughs> A Penn State official died on Wednesday following a crash in Harris Township. According to State College Police, Jeffrey P. Mamaro ran into the side of a privately owned pickup truck with a snowplow attached while he was jogging and crossing Bull Avenue at the Old, Old Bullsburg Road intersection. Mamaro, 43, was an assistant vice provost at Penn State who lived in Bullsburg. That's, that's sad. That's I really didn't read sad. that full thing. I yeah. thought he was in a car. Me too. Thoughts and prayers. With, Wait, but it uh, says Amaro that he family. he ran into it. Like, yeah, I don't. I'm. Yeah, he was confused. jogging. What? Or maybe that just means that it was like, like it was not the truck's plow. fault. Oh, he was. Like he probably like snowing. wasn't supposed to like. It was. It was snowing a lot. Because if break, right? like it probably yeah. did hit him, but if it says that, then it's like their fault. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Rest yeah. in peace to Jeffrey. Very sad. Peace and peace. Now joining us for our final headline, we have Tegan Stoudemire. Tegan, how are you? How was your break? I'm all right. It was okay. Did you do anything fun or just hung out? I got an internship. Ooh. Nice. Yay. Peas and peas to local whiskey. Using a great bartender. Um, what is your internship? Um, it's with Discover NEPA. It's, oh, um, I'm doing cool. photo and video work for them oh, over the summer. Nice. Congrats. That's awesome. Yay. Thanks, guys. Um, so what you got? All you right. Got um, Florida Gulf Coast hiring of friend of the show, Pat Chambers, is officially official. The team announced late Monday night. The Eagles introduced the former Penn State head coach with a press conference at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. Good for he- Pat Chambers. He deserves to be a head coach in college basketball. Um, yeah, he's the man. I love Pat. What's the playbook after you get stabbed? <laughs> this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, good for Pat. That's, That's all we got for headlines. Now we're going to get into our conversation with Trace McSorley. Joining us now, we have former Penn State quarterback, current quarterback for the Arizona Cardinals, Trace McSorley. Trace, welcome to Podward State. How's it going, man? What's up? <clears throat> Doing well. Appreciate you guys uh, having me on here. Yeah, absolutely. So just to start off a little bit, can you tell us how your are rec- um, recruiting journey went. You know, you had kind of a interesting recruiting journey where you uh, were interested in going to Vanderbilt and then eventually switched to Penn State. You had a situation with playing safety and with quarterback. Can you just tell us a little bit about how that whole thing played out? Yeah. Uh, so, like, going through all the recruiting process and everything, it was, uh, you know, part of it was a lot of the major, like, I guess at the time, like the – uh, bigger, like big conference power five schools were offering me like somewhere like looking at me as maybe a quarterback, but most of the offers were coming in at safety. Um, and then it was, everything was kind of like, they wanted to see me come to camp, actually see me throw in, in person before they decided that, okay, I could, I could play quarterback. They wanted to, you know, see me in person. So um, it, it was the same even with Vanderbilt. Um, so we were going through all that. Even Vanderbilt was one of the schools that they originally offered me a safety. And then uh, it was Coach Ronnie at the time was like, hey, I just need to see you throw in person. It's like one of Coach Franklin's rules. Is like we need to see every guy 
throwing, playing the position in person before we offered him as a quarterback. So I was like, all right, cool, no problem. Uh, we were doing like some spring practices and stuff. Um, and Coach Ronnie came out, saw one of those like spring workouts, and we did like a little after, stayed after and like threw uh, with me and some of my high school receivers. And then after, basically he left that afternoon, got a call from him, said, hey, you know, you're a quarterback, you're we're recruiting you as such. And then from like that point on, like even when I would go to the school, like when I first went to school to check it out, like Coach Franklin wouldn't let me talk to the defensive staff. Um, so like, for me, it was one of those things I was, he was showing that faith in me as like a quarterback. And then that was a position that he saw me as, and he was making that effort to, you know, show me that that's how they saw me. Um, so like, for me, really, that's kind of what it was. I had, at that point, I had kind of made the decision that I was only going to look at schools that were recruiting me as quarterback. Those that were recruiting me as a, a defensive back or safety or, you know, that athlete position, I wasn't going to go to those schools I was strictly going to school to play quarterback so uh that kind of you know that eliminated a good bit of the schools for me and then once I got down to Vanderbilt kind of you know fell in love with the coaching staff and obviously you're in Nashville like the city it kind of speaks for itself when you're down there um so that was you know for me how I ended up originally committing to Vanderbilt and then you know I think it was like in mid-January or something coach Franklin got the job at Penn State, uh, but because of, you know, recruiting rules, regulations, NCAA rules, stuff like that, he couldn't reach out to us and let us know what the deal was. Uh, so it was, he had to get cleared to be able to talk to recruits. So it was kind of like I'm sitting there, it was like two weeks before signing day, and I didn't know if I could still go to Vanderbilt because I didn't know who the coach was going to be there yet. I didn't know if Coach Rangel was going to want me to come to Penn State. I was hopeful. Um, that we could, but, you know, we really couldn't, he couldn't have contact with us. So there wasn't any way to like, for him to say it. So then finally he got cleared. Uh, he gave me a call and, you know, told me, Hey, I want you to just come up to Penn state, check it out. Like we want you to come here, but you know, it's, it's not too far from you and your family. You know, if you have time, we'd love to see you guys up here. And then we drove up uh, a couple of days later and, you know, basically once I saw that, you know, the university and set foot in Beaver Stadium and checked out the facilities and was still able to meet with the coaches and realize it was everything that I loved about Vanderbilt football wise, but on a much bigger level. Uh, you know, to me, it kind of like decision was super easy that, you know, where I was going to go play ball. When you first arrived at Penn State, you played behind Christian Hackenberg. What was that first season like for you? Uh, you know, first season was, it was, it was a really big opportunity for me just to kind of learn, you know, obviously Christian was coming off of, uh, you know, he was big 10 freshman of the year coming off his first season. And uh, I was at the time I was competing, two guys came in our class. So I was competing to, you know, win that backup job. And, but so I ended up winning that backup job, but I was still, they were going to try and redshirt me as much as possible. Uh, you know, and that, you know, knowing that situation would have, had to arise where if Christian got hurt, he had to go out, I would have had to go in and that type of deal. So that first year I think was big for me because I had to quickly learn how to prepare for, uh, you know, to be a quarterback in a, in a collegiate game and, uh, you know, how to watch film and how to, you know, get in tune with the game plan and know, you know, what we're, what we're doing. And I think that was just a big thing for me because I had to get up to speed quickly you know, I wasn't necessarily playing and getting that in-game experience, but all the preparation and that aspect of it, I was able to get. And, you know, Christian and Coach Ronnie kind of really helped me out a lot with that uh, and just really being able to sit back and see how Christian kind of prepared himself. And then, you know, the meetings of Coach Ronnie and he was he would take time during practices while Christian was getting his reps. I would stand right next to him, be talking with him, talking through the plays, talking through the reads and, you know, he would have me just, you know, hey, just out loud verbalize like what you would do in each situation. So making sure I was getting those mental reps. And I think that really helped me because that kind of became a routine for me. And then I continued to build it through my five years there. But it got me into that routine so that I knew how to prepare myself for when the days did come that I needed to be. I was playing and I was a starter. Kind of going back to your time, you know, right before Penn State um, in your recruiting process, I think I remember when he went on part of my take, like you said, you talked about how Hack was like your 
your guy or whatever. What do you do? You remember anything from that? And like what it was like, kind of walking around and touring with Christian Hackenberg as you know QB one back in 2013 or 2014, whatever year it may have been. Yeah. So I mean, I I know when we came on, uh, I had my official visit. They had me. I was with it was guy Austin Whipple. He was my official host, but like hit him and Hack. Obviously, they were quarterbacks. They hung out all the time, and Brennan was his roommate. And Brennan and Hack were like best friends. Um, so we all went out together and it was, it was crazy just to see, like, I think we tried to like go out to a frat party or something like that and see like, you know, at first they're telling, we don't have enough room. Like you guys can't come in, blah, blah, blah. It's a whole bunch of like young, you know, yep. high school recruits. Like they don't want us at their party. And then, you know, eventually like kind of Christian walks to the front door and he says one thing, shakes the guy's hand and he, they let everybody in. Um, so it was one of those deals where like, you could see kind of the power kind of behind that position. And, uh, it was just really cool. And at, at the same time, like he was super down to earth, like, you know, we're hanging out beforehand and they do like some dinners and stuff like that. And we're hanging out, talking to him. He's talking to my parents. He's a real cool dude. And I think it was, that was one of those things to see, like, you know, he was still able to just be a normal dude at the end of the day, even though he had the status of, you know, QB one at Penn state university, he was still able to have be down to earth and still have, you know, the kind of the, the roots that he'd always grown up with. For sure. Yeah. Brenneman was on the show. It was fun. He, he told us some recruiting stories and they were, they were pretty funny. So it's fun to hear about different people's uh, stories. What was that? Is that like he's got stories for days. So and if you let him, he'll keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, leading off of that in 2015, obviously you got your first like big playing time when you replaced uh, Hackenberg when he went down with in the uh, Tax Slayer Bowl against Georgia. Um, what was that experience like for you? You know, what did it feel like to be that true backup quarterback coming in when the starter gets injured? And um, did you know that there maybe would have been a chance that you were going to play in that game? Or, like, did you know that Hackenberg was potentially on his way out? Um. So, like, <clears throat> I would say, like, going into that game, it was basically the same as it had been for two years. Like there was no, like going into that, that bowl game, you know, we had a feeling that Christian was going to be leaving and going on in the NFL, but he didn't say anything to anyone. Like he was kind of keeping that, like, you know, playing that tight to the vest and all that. So going into that game, it was really as if every other game, like he was going to be playing, he was going out and he was going to be a starter and play the whole game. And I would go in if, you know, something arose where he had, gone down or we got up by a lot or down by a lot like those would be the situation where I was I would have been playing um but you know going back to what I said earlier like I had learned how to prepare as if for any situation like you would rather be prepared and I'm not needed than I'm not prepared and I'm needed to go in and try and win the game and then it's you know just bad for everyone involved so um it was able to you know be locked in throughout the entire that entire last two those two seasons and kind of that preparation all led, led to the one game. And I remember the play where like Christian kind of, he got like tripped up and landed hard on his, I think it was his shoulder. And he kind of got up like shaking it, holding it like that. And we were all like, Hey, just grab your helmet just in case. Like he was kind of, he signaled he was going to keep playing. And, you know, he stayed on the field and he went, went back and he threw a couple of passes and it seemed like everything was good. And then he threw one that I guess like it just, he felt something wrong in it. And I remember he kind of starts waving me on. I just feel someone like grab the back of my pads, and, like throw me on the field. And then, you know, you know, just went from there. But, you know, that, that game was, I think I got in, we were down by a lot. And it was kind of one of those things where like in my eyes and in how I was doing, it was like, well, we're down by a lot. Like it's, we got nothing to lose here. Like, let's go, let's play ball and kind of let's go win this game. And that's kind of how I, how I've always played the game was so, you know, play to win it. And no matter what the situation was, whether you're down by a lot, up by a lot, I always like to say you play to win the game. And that's how from the time I was, when my dad was my coach, when I was nine years old, that's how like he taught me to play the game. And that's kind of how I've, I've always gone about it. So going into that situation, uh, it was just, you know, play to win. And, you know, we were down by a handful of scores and one play wasn't going to get us back into it, but we were able to get a few plays that, we were able to get us some momentum and, you know, we had a chance at the end there to throw a Hail Mary and try and get it down there and hope for the best. But um, you know, I think that game was just 
it was good for me to be able to actually get in and you know, I'd made plays in practice, but going from practice to the game is completely different. So to be able to get in and like make plays in a real live situation, um, it was just a good confidence boost for me going into that spring where I'd be competing for the job. Yeah, that's kind of what we wanted to ask you about too. Obviously, I think you threw at least one touchdown in that game, um, despite not being able to have the full comeback. But um, you know, what kind of did that do for you? Did it really kind of make you feel like you had a leg up heading into that off season? Um, and also, Tommy Stevens being one of the guys you you battled with for that starting job um, in the twenty sixteen in the spring of twenty sixteen. How did that kind of eff- or kind of build your guys' relationship and make you guys closer? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Like that definitely gave me confidence going into it that I had been able to put out a successful outing on the field that I was able to show the coaches. You know, at that time, Coach Moorhead was he was he had been hired, but he wasn't technically a coach yet. Um, saying you know, NCAA rules, and he had to wait to get cleared and all that type of stuff. So he couldn't coach, but he was he was able to travel with us down to like uh, Jacksonville for the bowl game, like watch practices, and he was in the booth just like sitting there watching the game. Um, so for him to, you know, see me in game action, kind of get to be around me a little bit and how I was able to operate and go in and play the game. I think it just personally, it gave me confidence going into that spring where I knew we'd be competing. Um, but at the same time, you know, I knew that it was a completely new offense that we were bringing in. You know, I'd have to learn the offense and all that type of stuff and then still be able to go out and execute it. And I think the learning process, you know, for both, Tommy and myself, I think that brought us closer together because, you know, our relationship wise, like the two of us, we were, you know, helping each other learn the offense at the same time. And I feel like the competitive nature in a lot of people would be that, you know, you, you don't want to help the other guy you're competing against, but, you know, part of what, you know, I think made Tommy and I close was the fact that we were competing like hell on, on the field, but, we weren't trying to like, we weren't wishing ill on the other person. Like we weren't sitting there hoping the other one did bad. We weren't, I wasn't telling him the wrong read. He wasn't doing the same thing to me. Like you know, some of that stuff that you might think would happen. Like Tommy and I never had that, that kind of going on. And I think, you know, credit to just our quarterback room, coach Morad, how he ran things. And, you know, I think that spring we were competing and it really just brought everyone closer together. Even though I feel like a lot of people think like you compete, you kind of drift farther apart. Like we became closer to that that entire spring yeah we had Tommy on I think for our first episode of this season maybe second and he talked about that battle and he said something similar he basically talked about how uh it was basically team first and how he was willing to fall into whatever role and help you out even though you know you beat him in that battle um leading into 2016 obviously that year was really great we had a you know, something that Penn State hasn't had in a really long time, and it just was a very special year. But obviously the season started out a little rough with a um, heartbreaker in Pittsburgh and a uh, blowout in Ann Arbor against Michigan. What do you remember about the team's mindset in those early stages, specifically after the loss in uh, the big house? And how did you guys bounce back from that to go on to um, what many people would say to be Penn State's most successful year in uh, recent history? Yeah. Um, so I remember like kind of coming out of that pit game, like we were going into that pit game. We were still trying to like find ourselves. Like we, and we played Akron in our first game and like we won, I think we were able to put up a handful of points, but it wasn't as convincing as anyone would have liked it to have been. Um, you know, we were still kind of trying to find ourselves on offense, even on defense, probably a little bit. And then going into that pit game, obviously that was like the first time they were bringing back that rivalry and, I think, you know, we didn't expect it to be as like the atmosphere to be exactly quite what it was. And I think, you know, we kind of came out and, and Pitt went out to like a huge lead. They were up like 28, seven or 28, three, something like that early on. And I think that game was where we kind of were able to find ourselves in offense. It was like, all right, like we're down by down a bunch, you know, in years past, if we were down like this, we would kind of just, cave it in and, you know, try and move on to the next week. But, you know, we had to kind of find ourselves and we were able to get back into a, a position where we were down three, I think it was a two minute drive, like going to, you know, try and at least kick a field goal to tie it, you know, touchdown wins it. And um, you know, I think even for me, like that was that game, how that one ended, like you try to force something and 
you know, go for the juggler right, right then. And, you know, who needs a field goal when you can score six points together with a win? Like that was kind of what I was doing and, you know, ended up throwing an interception in the end zone, lost the game. Um, but it was a moment for us as a team to be able to find ourselves and like realize what our potential was. Like we were down and we kind of scored a bunch in the fury. Like our defense came on. We played really well in that second half, came up short, but we were able to like see our, what our potential could be. Um, and then, I mean, that Michigan game, I really just remember like, it felt like someone just punched us in the stomach for like an hour straight, which basically is exactly what happened. Um, but like, it was just an awful feeling like back in that locker room, like you could hear a pin drop. Like it was just silence. Like we didn't know like, what to, what to react to and what to expect. And kind of that same thing is like we knew our potential at that point, but we weren't, you know, obviously playing up to it. And we had talked about like where we wanted to be. Like we wanted to, you know, at that time win the Big Ten, play in a Big Ten championship. And, and that's where those are the goals that we had set for ourselves. But then, you know, we go play at the time. I think Michigan was the top team in the Big Ten or, you know, top five team in the country, wherever they were. And they just beat the hell out of us for four quarters and made us look like we didn't belong in that field. And the same kind of things. We knew our potential. We had to find ways to reach it. And that was just a moment for us to kind of like look ourselves in the mirror and, you know, say, hey, this is this is what we need to be. This is this is we're not doing what we can to be able to reach our potential. So what are the things we need to do to fix it? So we kind of went back to the drawing board and as players, a lot of people took a lot of accountability, like watching film with each other, not the coaches there, but being real honest with each other in the film room and you know, watching film together when we're going over the next team so that we're all on the same page heading into it. And I think that, you know, those type of things, one, it brought, you know, the chemistry we had on that team together because we could have honest conversations with each other. Like, I remember dudes would, like, call people out in our player meetings, like, you know, you're not doing what we need you to do or, like, hey, I need you to do this so I can do my job better, blah, blah, blah. Like, that back and forth that we were able to have, it – it helped us to be able to, you know, reach our potential and trust each other on the field. And then we went on that big run and kind of was able to, those things kind of just sprung us forward. So after the pit game, I remember um, you were doing a post game in the tunnel or whatever it was. And I know you know what I'm talking about, but <laughs> yeah. the, uh, you can hear in the background, you got interrupted by Tony Dorsett, who's a pit legend mm -hmm. shouting, hail to pit, hail to pit, hail to pit. After a loss like that, what was, like, your reaction? Because I remember afterwards they asked you about it and you had some, like, PC uh, response or whatever. But, like, yeah, yeah. what what were you actually feeling in that moment? Because I remember I was um, pissed. I was pissed when I saw that. It, so, in my head, I'm, like, thinking to myself, like, oh, we just had a tough loss. And it was the first one for me, like, as a starter where, like, it kind of, at the end, it felt, like, squarely on my shoulders. A bad decision, like, lost the game for us. And – you know, to have to deal with, you know, some, I didn't know who it was. I thought it was like some pit fan that, you know, was, had been drinking since eight in the morning and it was, you know, completely wasted just walking by and, you know, taunting kind of, you know, being an ass. And he, uh, you know, I just kind of, I remember like when it happened, I kind of like completely lost my train of thought, like, and, you know, had to ask the reporter, like, sorry, I asked that again, whatever. And then they told me it was Tony Dorsett. And I just chuckled. Like, I was like, <laughs> like that kind of, that makes it a little bit better that if anyone was going to do that, it was going to be a, you know, college football, you know, NFL legend that, you know, guys that he was just taunting and John and stuff like that. So it, it made it a little bit better, but yeah, in the moment, I definitely, you know, blood pressure, blood pressure rose a little bit. I remember um, like back being in high school when that game happened. And then I think it was like Mark Brennan, uh, free shout out, I guess, Mark Brennan. Um, <laughs> He he had like he did he had like a YouTube video up of you guys walking back into the locker room and the pit fans were like brutal. I do remember that really well. A lot of uh, a lot of mid middle fingers from oh. the. Uh, oh from yeah, the injuries, like, but... right, that was the first time. Like I remember, I'm sitting. I always sat kind of like next to my buddy uh, Billy Fessler, who was my roommate and another one of our quarterbacks. And uh, on the bu on the bus ride to the game, and I'm sitting there. I, I kind of had headphones in and just, you know listening to music, not really paying attention to what's going on outside. And I feel an elbow like in my arm just point out and it's just a row of pit fans just all flying the bird to our bus and we're driving by and like me and him look at each other like that's sick like let's go like just that atmosphere was it was awesome um you know i don't love like 
you know, people throwing the middle finger at me, but it, in that, con in that context and, you know, you're, you're going into, you know, enemy territory in college football, like yeah, that's going to happen. And I remember from that point on, like every away bus, bus ride to the stadium, I would look out the window and like try and find like, all right, who's doing it today? Or, like whatever. <laughs> um so it was that was one of the things like college football like I, I enjoyed about it then you run out and the entire stadium is booing you and you know just whatever fans could think to say to you they're saying it's just it's a it's a cool atmosphere to be in that situation for sure do you have a highlight and a low light of the 2016 season um I mean I'll say probably like the the low light would be that Michigan game just like as brutal as that went um highlight so that would be is that's like two tough ones because that was the year we beat Ohio State and at the whiteout and like the fans rushed the field afterwards and I remember I'm sitting there doing um they're kind of they're having me try to do like one of the interviews uh on field after the game and because like you like couldn't get through the crowd of people they kind of had like sectioned me off and like this one little like circular section where they were trying to wait for the uh, person who's doing the interview to get there and they ended up not being able to get there. So I'm like standing there waiting for this person to get there. And my buddy, Billy, his little brother who at the time was like, he might've been like 12 years old. He, I just see his face like emerge from like the sea of people. He's like, Trace, what's up, bro? And I'm like, James, what the heck? What are you doing? Like, where's your family? Like, he's like, I don't know. I lost him just some little kid like running around. So like that whole deal, like, I can still remember, um, you know, just to see a white people like celebrating on the field. Um, but then it's so hard to like say the big 10 championship and like winning that and celebrating on the field after that with, you know, being on the podium. Um, it's really hard to say that, like that wasn't the highlight of the year, but uh, so, I, I mean, those two, like I always go back to is like some of the, my highlights just from my time at Penn state in general. So, Towards the end of that season, obviously, right before um, the postseason play, we had the Big Ten Championship, which was an amazing experience for Penn Staters, especially just years after the, um, you know, the sanctions and everything that happened. What was that experience like for you? You said that you guys knew what you were capable of. You were that was your goal. So what was it like for you guys to win that game and to just feel the um, the love that came from Penn Staters because for me I grew up in State College and I was at that game with my dad and it meant so much more than just a normal Big Ten championship I remember I looked around me my dad my brother all grown men were all just crying in the stands and every other guy was like that and everyone there was just you know in a very emotional state because of what that meant to the program what did that mean to you as a member of the team, a leader of the team, and to go out there and play how you guys did, eventually winning MVP and bringing home the Big Ten Championship? Yeah, you know, I think, so for us, like you said, we had set out that goal of, you know, that's what, what we wanted to achieve that season was win the Big Ten Championship. And you know, I remember, you know, we started at the beginning of the season, and that was something that we hadn't done before was like, you know, talk about winning the Big Ten. It was always talk about winning the next game. Um, you know, Coach Randy is one game at a time mentality. He's still now he sees the tweets where he puts out the next team, like almost obnoxiously on Twitter. <laughs> um, but uh, so that was kind of his whole mentality was the next game. And uh, one of the seniors, I can't remember who it was, Brandon Bell or maybe it was Evan Schwan. Um, Friend of the show. Uh, they were doing like their meeting with Coach Franklin and they, said, they brought it like, Coach, like we understand the one game at a time mentality. Like that's that's how we have to approach it. But, you know, why don't we set – our ultimate goal and talk about it. Like, why can't we say like, you know, at the end of the season, we want to win the big 10, but you know, we need to get through week one to like focus on this week, but at the end of the day, like knowing where, where we wanted to get to. Uh, so we started to do that and, you know, it's kind of, you know, team meeting was starting coach ring put up, you know, a picture of the big 10 championship trophy. And then immediately we get, this is where we're going, where we want to get to, how do we get their next team? So still be able to keep the same mentality. Um, but I think just, you can really see how much it meant to those guys who had either been here when the sanctions came out and were, you know, the fifth year seniors or the guys that had, you know, committed to Penn State during that time. And they were going to be that recruiting class that was going to help, you know, Penn State through that entire time. And 
when, you know, everyone told him that they were crazy to go to a school like Penn state because they'd be, you know, down for the count for the next 20 years. Um, and so for those guys, I remember like seeing all those guys who came in together and how they, you know, celebrated on the field after that whole deal was, that was really cool to see because you could see how much it meant to them when everyone told them that they were insane for even going to Penn state at that time. Uh, and then like, you know, for guys like me, it was just, you know, we had just won the big 10 and, you know, at the same time we came to the school knowing like we wanted to be the ones to bring Penn state back to that glory that, you know, Penn state, when I was growing up, they were always held in that. They were always, you know, playing top of the big 10. They were in New York six bowl games all the time. Like that's where, you know, I remember, that's what I remember Penn state being when I was growing up. So it was one of those things like to, be a part of that team that kind of brought Penn State back and, you know, bring them to and kind of restore that glory that that is Penn State football. It was something that was that was really special. And I think all of us were like we still stay like some of those guys, we still stay in touch and we can still go back to that 2016 season and talk about stories that, you know, from the locker room to, you know, Saturday nights out celebrating. Like we still like can talk about those those days. And it's it's really cool that we have that bond now that we're a part of that. So the Rose Bowl was a crazy ending to that year. What was going through your head when the scoring kept going back and forth down the stretch? Um, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> like how that game started off, you know, it basically started off a lot like that pit game where we went down big early and uh, I wasn't playing so great to start that game. And kind of funny story about that is like, the, I know it was the first two passes that I threw were interceptions. One was like a miscommunication and then one, was a little bit off, went off someone's hands and got intercepted. And I get back to the sideline and I'm pissed off. Like I just need to sit by myself and just be pissed off for a minute. And coach Moray came up and he sat down next to me. He's talking to me, he's, you know, we're going through the game plan. They're trying to calm me down. You know, like, I got you, like I settled down. And then as he, you know, you were finished up that conversation, he kind of hits me. I was like, Hey, Oh, by the way, we're wearing blue today. So throw to those guys. And it was one of those things where like, for me, as mad as I was, it made me laugh and kind of like settled me down a little bit. Um, but anyway, so the game goes on and we kind of hit that spurt where we scored like on, it was like five plays in a row. Like we had a turnover or something like, we, it was like a just onslaught of us scoring. And then we were up big, then it kind of went back and forth. And then, you know, Sam Darnold starts going up and down the field, like just dropping dimes left and right. And we're sitting there on the sideline and like, dude, can you believe like, what's going on like this dude like just he can't throw an incompletion you just can't miss and it was one of those games where it was like just going back and forth like offensive offensive game like and you know, obviously you know same kind of deal that happened ended up trying to force some interception and they won the game but uh you know in that moment it was just like as the scoring is going back and forth it was you just couldn't really believe like how that game was going it was literally like big play big play back and forth like like you would, it was almost like a video game type, like just teams are scoring. It was big plays left and right and you couldn't get a stop. So I know this is, this is definitely a tough question, but I just, the Rose Bowl was such a fun game. I, I was there for that one actually, which was sick being in California yeah. for that game. Um, but do you have a favorite play from that game? Maybe even from your perspective or from the team's perspective as a whole? I mean, there's a lot, but. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. Um, so like that we came out in, the, well, so one of my favorite plays was it was early on in the game, but we kind of we had tried to we call it like a double move to Chris Godwin on a Dory Jackson. And they blitzed from my left and kind of forced me to like roll out to the right and I'm rolling out. And Chris had won on the route, but he kind of like I'm rolling right. He was going the other way. And so I couldn't really like throw it back. And then at the last second, he kind of like flipped and threw his arm up over the other shoulder. And I'm like by the sideline, I just kind of threw it up to the corner to him. And he was able to kind of like make the catch, drag a toe in, inbounds and, and get the touchdown. And I think that was, you know, even though early on, it wasn't like one of the big plays that it kind of set us off, but it was just like a really cool play that I always liked and how it, it unfolded, like had to roll out, you know, throw, you know, deep ball roll on the run with pressure in my face. And Chris made a hell of a catch, you know, to get a toe in, get control. And, and get the touchdown. 
I remember he had he had that one handed catch too. That was crazy. I mean, that was like, like midfield. All those quick big plays are like yeah. that's what immediately popped into my head. It was like they're obviously there's Saquon's run that still gets played on like college game day because he made the entire defense miss. And then there's the play to Chris where he kind of went up, tipped it to himself, um, yeah. and was able to score a touchdown. And then you know there were a ton of big plays like. I said, we went back and forth. I think it was like five straight plays or something that we scored on. You know, B-Bell had his interception where he brought it back down to the one-yard line. Like, it was just – there's so many huge plays in that game. Um, but the one I was talking about to Chris, that's that's probably my favorite one, just how, you know, the X's and O's and, like, how it kind of unfolded. For sure. Definitely a good choice. You were talking about Chris Godwin there, Saquon a little bit. That offense under Joe Moorhead was so electric, and I think that people sometimes take it for granted how many stars were on the team. What was it like to play with, you know, Saquon and Chris Godwin and just have those guys at your disposal to just, like, have fun with? Like, it was like a lot of the stuff that went through that Joe Moorhead offense was, like, fun plays and it seemed like you guys were just enjoying playing football. Yeah. Um, I mean, it definitely it made it fun because – like I said, we had so many weapons, and that offense was kind of always predicated on, like, all right, they're going to take away the run. Like, all right, we'll go RPO, throw, you know, pass right behind them or, you know, deep shots, kind of trying to loosen them up. And then once they loosened up, it was, we handed off to Saquon. And, you know, we even had things where it was like, all right, they're kind of shading more towards Chris. Like, so we'll work to Deshaun or Saeed or hey, they're leaving Mike Kosicki in a one-on-one matchup. Like, we had so many options that – you know, for us going into it, we were able to kind of construct our game plan around uh, and the conversation we had in, in our quarterback room, right? This is what we're looking at based off of what they show coverage wise and, you know, schematically what we think we can attack. But we were able to kind of go down a list of, you know, options like, all right, if, but what if they do this? Like, this is where we're going to, this is how we're going to adjust to it. And we we're able to have those adjustments kind of ready so that, you know, that year everyone called us a second half team and we were going to halftime and, we would literally like talk through those adjustments that we had talked about earlier in the week. Like, all right, Hey, this is, this is how they're playing us. So now, you know, we're going to be able to use, you know, take advantage of Mike in a matchup or, you know, we're going to run some of these runs because how they're, you know, trying to blitz us or, you know, whatever it was like, that's, that's what made it fun that year. Cause we did have so many weapons and so many guys at our disposal that were great playmakers, athletes that we could, you know, put the ball all over the field. And it was like, you know, we all coach Moore had a saying like um uh the defense thinks they have the answer like no we're going to change the question like that was I think that's what it was saying something like that um and that was kind of how his offense worked and how we always went went about it one thing I wanted to ask quickly about um you know obviously you and Saquon being in the same backfield a lot of big plays a lot of good memories from that but one that sticks out to me is um the 2017 win like the blowout against Michigan like the first or second player for scrimmage or whatever it was, you guys did that shift, and then Saquon went, like, untouched. I was always curious about that because I think I remember it getting worked into other plays, but, like, what do you remember about that? You know, was it, um, like, when did Joe Mo start to work that into um, practice and the game plan and that kind of thing? I was just curious about that quickly. Yeah, it was kind of like – so I don't know exactly how he got the idea for it, but I remember we came out to a practice. We had a bye the week before we played Michigan. So we're doing, like, our bye week practice, and those were, like, pretty light like that was when you know they tried to let a lot of like the older guys you know rest up a little bit and then you know, it was like the younger guys were in pads like we called them like dirty show practices it was scrimmage like they were a ton of fun like live red shirt practices like the guys were all retro and they would line up and you know do live scrimmages so it was a lot of fun um but I remember like early on in one of those practices like coach Moorhead like brought the two of us over like let me just let me try something here like, I kind of want to just kick the wheels on this and he explained it to us and like we did it and then it was the whole like you know do you think Saquon can read it or like or is it just we do use, utilize the fake it looks the exact same or like are we going to have him read it or whatever like, there's those like details that he had to figure out um but he kind of just like we came out to practice and he was like let me just see how this looks and we did it and it was just me and him and we had someone snap us a ball just to see like us, us to do it and then we we're going through the week we kind of installed it and we we're run it in practice and it was starting to look better and we kind of like came out and Joe Moorhead was kind of like I just I want to run this early like I want to see you know it was a it was a run that we liked against their defense um even if you know I was in the position like we you know, we ran that play all the time um but he just wanted to see how they would react and then 
you know, we thought it could be a big playoff. We didn't think it would be necessarily the 80 yard run. It was that just set that entire night off, but yeah, no, it was, it was cool. Cause like you said, coach Moore was so creative that we were able to do certain things like that. We had so many weapons and we were able to work it in different ways. And, you know, we used Tommy in like a two quarterback scenario. So like the two of us would do it. It was one of those things that we were able to kind of work in and, and utilize a bunch. Yeah, I was curious about that because it looked looked very cool. It worked well. Um, yeah. So obviously, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, so your time uh, at Penn State finishes up after the 2018 season, five seasons with the Ninny Lions, uh, obviously three starting. You can kind of go on and on about the records you have. You went 31-9, and nine, won a Big Ten championship, won a Fiesta Bowl, went to a Rose Bowl. Uh, you've got sing- several single-season records, a ton of career records, program records at Penn State for a quarterback. Um, so with all that in mind, obviously, what do you feel like your legacy at Penn State is and kind of where do you think your place is among other Penn State legends, not even just at quarterback, just Penn State legends in general? Yeah, um, I mean, so I think probably the, the one of the records I'm most proud of is just, you know, the wins and losses. I, I feel like that at the end of the day is, like I said, I, I always played to win the game. That's how I was always brought up. And to finish out my career as, you know, the winningest quarterback in school history with all the success that that program has had throughout, you know, college football history, all the great players, quarterbacks that kind of came through that uh, through Penn State. That was always one of the ones that when I knew like I was I had that in my sights, like that was the one I wanted. Um, you know, the passing yards is great. That's what, you know, fans love to see and all that type of stuff. But kind of for me, I always, I always lean back on that winning record. And I think that's something that I've always been able to hang my hat on. And, you know, records are meant to be broken. So one day it will be broken. Who knows when? But uh, that's one I want to see trying to, you know, survive as long as possible. For sure, that makes sense. Um, and yeah, kind of going off of that, obviously in 2018 it ends, the Citrus Bowl doesn't go as planned. You guys you guys dropped that game, but still I think, um, I was just curious about how you think that impacts your legacy in a positive way because I think, I mean, even despite that being a loss, I feel like so many Penn State fans remember that fondly as a memory of you just even through the latter half of that season, grinding through the injury you were dealing with and then playing through it in the Citrus Bowl. How do you feel like that kind of plays into it as well, kind of the way you, I guess, approach the game? Yeah, no, I think what you said, like, I always try to, you know, play with some, a little bit of edge to my game, like chip on my shoulder and, uh, you know, always kind of being like physically and mentally tough. And I think, you know, my first two years, I was extremely fortunate to not have any like significant injuries. I had like ankle sprains and, you know, the stuff that happens in football, but nothing that was ever like kind of super significant until I had the knee injury against Iowa. And, you know, I think that was something that I, had to just fight through and you know I you know the way I got my start at Penn State was someone got hurt and I was able to go in and play in that game and kind of the rest was history from that point on so um you know I I didn't want that to happen to me where I I got hurt and you know I knew Tommy was a great player and it wasn't like I had ill will against Tommy but like I said I was always a competitor and I wanted to I wanted to get back on the field I didn't want to lose my job so it was one of those things that I, you know, kind of had to just power through and was able to work with the trainers and do a bunch of rehab. And I was able to rehab it back pretty, pretty quickly. So I wasn't able, I didn't end up missing games. I was able to play in the rest of the games and be able to get out there and, you know, lead our team to a few more victories and help us get to that Citrus Bowl. And like I said, unfortunately it didn't work out how we wanted it to, but I think that year, that second half of the year kind of was able to show that, that kind of, grittiness and toughness that I, that I always played with that I always kind of had, but it was hard to kind of, it's hard to show that if you don't have to like fight through something and fight through that adversity. And I think that just kind of, you know, culminated in how my career kind of always went. Like I was always, uh, you know, overlooked a little bit, you know, underrated, you know, all those type of the underdog and all that type of stuff that people always try to pin on me that I always try to work through. And this was just one more thing that I had to kind of fight through at the end of my Penn State career to kind of you know show who the type of player who I was so we have a couple more questions for you we appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us um after the season you get invited to the combine you know you go in and people were like you said doubting you a little bit maybe a little bit because of your size you're a little undersized 
you go, you get drafted in the late rounds, you get drafted to the Baltimore Ravens, you play with Lamar Jackson, someone who also had some doubts surrounding him and his throwing ability and stuff. What was it like to play with Lamar Jackson on that team that kind of also, similar to Penn State, had an electric offense? And how did you fit into that role on the Ravens as a backup and something similar kind of to, in my opinion, at least what Tommy played at Penn State where they moved you around, they did special things because of your athleticism, including special teams? Yeah, um, so – First, just like touching on the like type of player Lamar was um, and playing with him, like, and that was the year, my rookie year was the year he was, he won the MVP, like unanimous MVP, like no one could stop him. And it was one of those things that was just special to watch. Like, we'd be sitting there in film and like going into the week and we'd be talking like through some of our run game stuff and you know, coach went like, hey, Lamar, like, you know, this is going to be the unblocked guy. Like, that's just let you know, that's going to be the guy you have to negotiate and deal with. And say, yeah, yeah, coach, like I got him. Like, don't worry about him. And, you know, he was like, all right, cool. Like just letting you know. And then we get into the game and it plays out. And like Lamar just, it's like he had seen it already and like had been uh, visualized it or whatever. But, like he, he knew what he was going to do before that. Like he knew he was going to set a guy up, by go outside and, you know, fake leagues come back inside one leg jab and bounce around the outside and you know the guy ends up on his ankles and is on a highlight on sports center the next day so it's like you know being around a guy like that it it was just special to watch and special to be around and be able to see how he sees the game and you know how he sees plays develop and defenses and how he's trying to attack how he's throwing guys open and you know there's the chemistry he's got with like a guy like Lamar Mark Andrews um you know the two of them are, are Literally, basically like the same wavelength when they're when Mark's running a route like he knows where Lamar wants him to get to and Lamar has that trust to throw it before Mark's there because he knows like they're on that same page so to see the two of them operate was uh, super special to be around and it's a huge learning thing for me um, just to be able to see and you know see that's how you kind of have to operate at, at this level as a quarterback with that trust in your receivers seeing things before they happen being able to anticipate and that type of stuff um and then, you know, being able to, you know, I came in, they had talked to me a little bit about like a special teams, like Taysom Hill role and, uh, you know, tried it out a little bit. There were a few things that I was able to do, like through practice and stuff like that. Ended up not being getting on the field and doing it, but uh, it was it was definitely a uh, an experiment that we went through. And, uh, you know, it's, it's different, you know, when you get down there and you're trying to block a dude that's 240 pounds running full speed for 40 yards on kickoff return. and it's uh yeah it was it wasn't the easiest thing to be able to get out there and do uh so those dudes that you know play special teams in the league it's a uh, you know people don't realize how how tough that deal is and how big those collisions are because once you once you're in there and you know you get hit in the face with the dude that's like you said been running for 40 yards with full head of steam it it's uh it ain't the easiest job out there so there's it definitely just personally it raised my level of respect for those guys that make their careers as a, a long, you know, career special team guy and uh, or do it at a super, super high level. Did Lamar really have cramps or did he just have to poop? <laughs> uh, I swear to God, he actually did have cramps. Uh, I feel like I got asked that on the Barstool uh, podcast as well. But, like, I remember we're sitting there, he came off the field. Uh, he, we had a handoff to JK and he scored. And he comes off the field and his – his fist is just locked up. Like he can't open his hand. Like his, his forearms are cramping and they're giving him all those pickle juice, Gatorade and stuff like that. And it's like been drinking so much like fluids that his stomach's so full that now like his stomach's cramping. You know, he's, you got that video where he's walking in where <laughs> admittedly it does look like he's, he's got to hit the bathroom as fast as he can. He's saying like running like his calves were locking up on him and everything. So they brought him back in there to get the IV and obviously it, was able to help him out and get back out there. So while you were in Baltimore, you became a TikTok sensation. What was that kind of attention like? And was it like weird for you? Uh, yeah, it was a little weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> like I've I've never been one that's been like super active on social media. Like I'll I'll post here and there, and you know I'll try and do some things, and you know just kind of be active. I'm more like I look through stuff and look through stories and like 
at that time I didn't even have like TikTok downloaded on my phone. Um, and I woke up one morning and I had, it was a Snapchat from a dude that I played high school football with probably hadn't talked to since I graduated high school. And he sent me a snap, like shared the TikTok on a Snapchat with me and, uh, you know, responded back. Like, I think I just gave the laughing emoji, like chuckled at it, like whatever, you know, moved on. And then it just blew up from there. And at the time, like, even now it's still weird. Like I remember one of the games uh, I got out to Arizona and I'm walking out on the field and I'm in, you know, sweats. I just got there. I'm in sweats getting ready for the game. And there's some little kid that's singing the lyrics to the song. <laughs> it's like, it's still so crazy that like all these like young, young kids, it's like they know me more from the the song and the TikTok than they do like me actually being on the field. So it's it's just funny to I've been able to embrace it a little bit and you know laugh at it and enjoy it while I can. So like the same same guy same guy did a Jahan Dotson song, right? I'm pretty sure. I don't know if you saw that one. Yeah, and he did it. I, did did one one. I mean, he he did like the uh, the Saquon Barkley one that was the he kind of does one every year, but yeah, for whatever reason, like that one caught on and. You know, You're stuck. I think TikTok originally was like it was like a Madden thing, and then it became just like this whole meme. And like, um, I after practice that day, like came in and you know all these accounts like posting the lyrics under my, all my like Instagram pictures on my posts, and like even now if I post something, even if it's just like a random picture that has nothing to do with football, someone's gonna just post the lyric like underneath that. It's just like it's it's funny. That is funny. Um, so yeah, you kind of mentioned it a little bit, but how was, you know, going from Baltimore, you, you made the move to Arizona. How, how was that? And, uh, how's your time been with the Cardinals so far? Yeah, it, it's been awesome. I love it out in, uh, out in Phoenix, um, stay, I usually stay like in that Phoenix Scottsdale area. I mean, just that area in general is awesome. Like it's good living and awesome weather and, and everything like that. Like I got out there, um, it was the week of Thanksgiving. So I, I got out there and it was, you know, 60 and sunny. And then I get a picture from my mom, you know, it's my dog playing in six inches of snow out in their backyard. Um, so it's, I've, I've really enjoyed my time. The team's been awesome. Uh, love playing for Cliff. He's, you know, the type of coach that, you know, I relate a lot to. He kind of coaches with a chip on his shoulder, like a young coach feel like he's a lot of people try and say like, he can't, you know, he might not be able to make the adjustment from college to the NFL, but he's, proven year in and year out that, you know, just keeps getting better. And I think, you know, playing for a coach like that, he's got a chip on his shoulder. It, it helps you as a player, just, you know, you relate to him and he, he keeps it fun and light and just super enjoyable being out there. Um, but that transition was, was kind of crazy. It was like my first hands-on experience, like the business of the NFL. Um, you know, I was on practice squad in Baltimore uh, this whole year. And, you know, we were, we knew I could be, claimed and picked up so we kind of had an eye on you know what was going on around the league just to see what would maybe happen and then I, I remember I get out of practice on Friday and I have a text from my agent and it just says like call me Arizona wants to is going to pick you up so at that point I'm like oh shit I'm oh, sorry <laughs> oh, uh, you're good man <laughs> excuse my language um you're good uh, but I just was like oh all right so I remember I was like all right hey, I'm still at the facility like let me call you when I leave and like, I was sitting there, I'm in the hot tub, like after hot, hot cold tub after practice, I'm like, I got to figure out what's going on here. Like, I couldn't wait, like, to get home. So I called him, like, hey, you know, what's the deal? He, he gives me the rundown and there starts talking. And then, you know, kind of the business aspect comes into it because that was the week when I was in Baltimore, Lamar had been sick all week. So there was still a chance that, like, I'd be needed to suit up for Baltimore when we played the Bears that week. So there was kind of like a little bit of, you know, when do I get out there? You know, obviously Baltimore wanted me for that weekend in case Lamar wasn't feeling well, which he ended up not feeling, you know, up and up you know, well enough to play in that game. He was still pretty sick. So ended up, you know, having to suit up for that game. And then that was on Sunday. I flew back with the team to Baltimore Sunday night. Basically had to, you know, go drop off my iPad with, you know, at the team facility at, midnight because I had a flight out the next morning to Arizona at like 8 a.m. I had, you know, basically before we left for Chicago, I had bags packed, ready to go. Um, 
and then got to Arizona, had to do, you know, the physicals and that kind of stuff and then sign. But um, it, was, it was a crazy couple couple of days there where I was – I didn't necessarily know exactly what was going to happen, how it was all going to play out. But, you know, super thankful for – obviously everything that happened in Baltimore and the opportunity they gave me, but definitely really excited to be where I'm at now and, you know, kind of on a team that's up and coming, got a lot of momentum behind them and, you know, excited to get back there and, get the season started in you know a few months basically when we go back for OTAs. That is interesting. I feel like, you know, as fans, you don't necessarily think about the like crazy process that it is, guys getting moved moved around and stuff and free agency, that kind of thing. But yeah, that does that's nuts. Just the quick move. Yeah, no, it was crazy. I mean you hear about, you know, the business of the NFL, but and you know, being there, like I saw guys in and out, you know, week in, week out. There's a new guy basically every week. Um, but you know, how actually being you know, one of those new guys that's just on the move, um, you know, at the drop of a dime, drop of a hat. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely a crazy business to be a part of. This is random, but Phoenix had me thinking, are you a big golf guy or no? Because it had me thinking of the Waste Management Open. I'm like the yeah. 16th yeah. hole there. Yeah, so I, I've i gotten into golf, you know, in the off seasons a little bit. Uh, you know, last off season was the first one I really kind of got into it. So uh, definitely some good golf out there. You know, we yeah. do – a bunch of us from Penn State, all all the guys I've roomed with, you know, we did a trip out to Kiowa Island last year. You know, this year we're we're gonna do one in Scottsdale. Um, you know, take advantage of the golf out there. So, uh, it's that it's a good place for for golf. I know that for sure. Yeah, just it, yeah, got me thinking about that. That's cool. So before we ask our final question, we've been letting our guests choose the intro outro song for the episode. So do you have a song pick? I'm assuming no Maddie Fresh. <laughs> Um, that song was used. Somebody yeah, used Fair, that. Uh, Adam Talaferro used that as his his pick. The Adam Adam did, I would have thought Adam would have had like a little bit more like old school vibe to him. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Uh, but all right. Uh, I don't know why, but like the only the thing that comes to my head, and it's probably because someone had asked me this, uh, like last week, was that uh. Hold on, I'm looking at my phone right now because I actually did forget the name of it. Oh, that uh, Zombie Nation song. Oh, yeah, and, Beauty. Uh, <laughs> the one that plays throughout the stadium. Like, someone had literally two days ago asked me, like, yo, what's the name of that song? And, like, I was kind of embarrassed to be like, I didn't know the name of it because, like, I heard it all the time, but I'd never, like, seen it on, a, you know, came through on my phone or whatever. I'd never put it on myself. I just played through the stadium when I was in there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you can go with that one. So our final question is, do you have any advice for college students in general? Um, so advice, uh, I mean, really, so kind of, I would say it's just two prong. One would be just, just to enjoy the college experience as much as you can while you're going through it. Um, obviously, there's a lot of pressure and stress that's involved, classes and external things that go on, but you try to enjoy it as much as possible. And then the one, the other thing that kind of it goes along with that stress is being able to find something that is able to be like your stress reliever, whatever it is, whether you know music, you know, whatever it might be, just being able to find a way that, I mean, I remember there were times where um, I was an accounting major, I'm trying to study for like my accounting finals, and I'm locking myself in a room for nine hours, just going through outlines and you know driving myself crazy, and I think. It, I, had, I was able to have find ways that I was able to, you know, just get away from everything. Like I would just in the middle of studying, like not in the middle of it, when it was all done, like I would go home and I would just play video games, like give myself like a good hour and a half of just like just disconnect from whatever I had just been studying, whatever spreadsheets I'd just been looking at, um, being able to disconnect a little bit and just kind of, you know, do a little, little bit of, you know, self, uh, I don't even know what to call it, just like self-help or whatever it was, you know, whatever you call it, like just being able to have a way to kind of disconnect and get away from the stress and just, you know, be a, be a college student and enjoy hanging out with your friends. Cause like that time, it, it, it's weird to say now. Cause like, I feel like I'm my parents talking about it. Like I'm super old, but I'm not, or at least I think I'm not. Uh, but just being able to enjoy that time that you, know, you could sit in your living room or sit with your roommates and, Really just talk nonsense and it, it doesn't affect anything, but you're just enjoying being there with each other. 
Trace, we appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. I know a lot of Penn State fans are going to enjoy this. Um, it was really fun watching you uh, light it up on the field for four years, and um, we look forward to seeing you succeed wherever it may be, Arizona, Baltimore, TikTok, whatever. <laughs> appreciate you coming on. I don't on TikTok too much, but you know, look forward to this next year in Arizona. But appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, appreciate y'all reaching out and let me come on and uh, have a good conversation with y'all. That was our conversation with Trace McSorley. Now we're going to hop into some sports talk with Kiwi Lamb and Will Pegler. How are you guys doing? Doing well. How are you, Connor? I'm doing great. I'm doing well, too. Shining, good weather today. Very, that was very fun talking to Trace. I'm glad, I, hope, uh, I hope that was an interesting conversation. It was definitely a long one, but Penn it was State fun. legend, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's hop into it. Uh, we have some big football news coming up with NFL free agency and the NFL Combine. Will, you want to start us off with that? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of franchise tag stuff. Um, Chris Godwin, we just talked about him with Trace, awesome wide receiver for the Buccaneers. A lot of big news for the Buccaneers, but they just French, they, Chris, geez, sorry, he received the tag from the Buccaneers. Um, they definitely want him back for a good reason. You know, he's obviously a great wide receiver alongside Mike Evans. Um, and his deal, it has yet to be structured into a long term one, but next year he's set to make about 19 million. Yeah. Um, so not too shabby. And Tom Brady's back throwing football, so yeah, nice paycheck. Good we'll news overall, right? Morphs into something more next year. Yep. Uh, obviously, Mike Gesicki's kind of in the same boat. He his deal was restructured into a ten point nine million dollar deal. So shout out to him, and he also signed it on his honeymoon, which is pretty cool. Did you guys? Um, congrats to him and his wife, ha- Haley. I think it's Hallie. Hallie Proper. Um, congrats to them. But did you guys see the video of uh, like Saquon and like all the like former Penn State players like dancing at the wedding and like uh-huh. Mike had his shirt off. That was amazing. He's definitely a meathead, but I like him. No offense, Mike. Yeah, ha- but <laughs> having Saquon as a hype man is something yeah. that would be pretty cool. Yep. Um, also, Allen Robinson's kind of in the same boat. He was expected to be tra- franchise tagged, but he wasn't. So he hit the free agent market. Any predictions on where he's going to go? Come to the Giants, Allen. That would be awesome. Awesome they, team. They <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I don't know. What, what do you got? I don't really have any predictions. What do you guys I, think? I want him to play in Green Bay with Rodgers. I That'd think he sick. deserves a big time quarterback. So that would be and pretty cool. Adrian Amos is like yep. one of his best friends. Yeah, super, super six. Remember those? Yeah, guys? super six. Yeah. Going into NFL stuff a little bit more. The NFL Combine was last week. Uh, who did well and who impressed? Do you guys have any insight on that? Go for it. Um, Castro <laughs> Fields um, ran an impressive 40 meter dash at 4.38 seconds. It's pretty darn fast. Um, he also received an athleticism score of 97 from NFL Next Gen Stats and tied among combine participants since 2013. So that's pretty big as well. I think um, another big one was Brandon Smith. I don't think that was really a surprise to anyone or anyone that watched Penn State. I mean, he's an awesome athlete. He finished fourth among linebackers in all the major categories. So that's the 40-yard dash, uh, the vertical leap, and the broad jump. And I also saw, uh, like, this picture of him. I don't know. I just saw it on Instagram. It's, it, like, some, like, NFL reporter tweeted it, um, which was, he just looked like he's, he's, just, he's like an alien. I don't even know. Yeah. But, yeah, so that's pretty exciting. I mean, another couple of defensive stars, you know, developing in the NFL maybe, so that's exciting. Yeah, also Arnold Ebiketti had a great combine. Uh, he was second among edge rushers in the vertical jump, broad jump, and fourth in bench press reps, so huge, pretty good showing from him. I um, And then I wanted to say something about Jahan Dotson, so he ran a 4 four three forty. I don't know if anyone saw this, but there was like an NFL reporter who was talking about how like, oh, Jahan ran a slow 40, but he's like considered a burner, that's bad. Come on, man. Like, do better. Like, uh, he's yeah. not like, th- like that's and that's like thing. his third best attribute. Like, speed. So, like, at the, at the point, what's the difference between a 439 and a 443? That, too. It, it, like, pad speed it's is fast, different fast is than fast. straight line speed. So, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. If you guys watch the Maryland tape, you'll see him burn through that entire secondary the entire game. So. Or the, but, like, and even against Auburn or the other big games, like, it was his route running and, you know, hands. Yeah. That were, like, and he did it for three years. Too, yeah. So yeah. That's a that's yeah. pretty bad tape. Wanted, wanted to get that in. Uh, moving on to wrestling, the NCAA Wrestling Championships begin this week on Thursday, March 15th. Uh, Will and the wrestling crew is going to be there, so Woo-hoo. that's yeah. pretty exciting. Do you any, have anything on that, Will? I mean, yeah, it'll be uh, we're, a couple of guys are coming off of the Big Ten individual titles. Didn't get the uh, team title. They, Michigan, what, was one and a half points Michigan beat out Penn State by? I think um, so that was tough, but I mean, all the guys... All the Yeah, I mean, Drew Hildenbrandt kind of, he was a two-seed. He had a tough loss at Big Tens, but 
RBY, Nick Lee, Carter Starachi, and Max Dean all won individual titles. Um, that's pretty much everyone who's expected to besides Aaron Brooks. He lost to another Michigan man. Uh, Jordan, you remember his name? I'm sorry, I'm blanking on it. The guy uh, Aaron lost to in the final, was that it? Was it Massa? I always forget it. Yeah, something like that. So, yeah. so but <laughs> we don't, it's, it's okay. He, th- yeah, he was... He was expected to win. He didn't, obviously, but still a ton of momentum going into nationals. The guys I just listed are kind of expected to kind of dominate. Um, they're kind of all at the top of their weight classes, not just only in the Big Ten, but in um, NC, the NCAA as a whole. I think uh, Drew Hildebrandt is another guy to highlight over at 125 pounds. Like I said, he was the number two guy in the Big Ten conference, but he got knocked out quickly and didn't really do that well in consolations either. So that sucked because like they were they got much many a lot fewer team points. Uh, and that really hurt in terms of the team conference race. Um, but I think that makes them hungry, too. You know what I mean? They're uh, very fun to watch. And it'll be um, – we'll be there myself, um, Mara McKeon, friend of the show, fellow uh, contributor, contributor, and Aaron Sullivan will be shooting it for us. Highly recommend following along. It'll be Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So a busy few days. But it's pretty exciting. And if you want, really want to see Penn State like dominate in a sport more so than – a lot of other sports. I highly recommend watching it on ESPN. Yeah, definitely. I'm excited for the matchups other than the number one seeds, like yep. Bartlett, uh, probably playing Sasso again. That would be pretty cool. So, big stuff coming up for Penn State wrestling. Yeah, men's basketball. They just finished their season. Uh, kind of an electrifying round in the Big Ten tournament, marked by two wins: one over Minnesota in the first round and Ohio State in the second round, which was a great game in the second half comeback. Keely, do you have anything on that? Gosh, those were really fun games to watch. Um, I really enjoyed watching Jalen Pickett all week. Like, oh my gosh, so great. He scored 22 points against Minnesota in the first round and then 16 points against Ohio State. Um, Totally second half, killed it, but um, (laughs) it was really fun. That was a 71-68 upset win over Ohio State. Um, and then they moved on to the quarterfinal against Purdue, which was seeded number three in the tournament. Um, sad 69 to 61 loss. I didn't get to watch that one. I was on an airplane, but don't tell United this. I turned my airplane mode off like before I landed. Oh I know, God. criminal. And I was Jeez. refreshing Almond State Sports. My dad was behind me, like kicking my seat. And we, it was really fun to watch or you, pretend to watch. Were you trying to keel everyone on the flight? I was. <laughs> I was. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I had to. Sorry, Keely. <laughs> no. um, but yeah, so that was a sad loss. But um, awesome season for Shrewsbury, in my opinion. Um, and I think it was a good first year for him, and I'm very excited Jalen Pickett is coming back for another year. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, he put up 18 points a game in the Big Ten tournament, so to do that against Jaden Ivey and Purdue, and obviously Ohio State has a pretty stout front court too, so that was that was awesome to see. Um, obviously, capping off basketball, John Hara finished up his Penn State career. Um, kind, of, kind of marked as a Penn State basketball legend to most, for sure. just the way he stuck with the program through three different coaches, so... Obviously, we're gonna miss John Hare in a Penn State uniform. He, uh, yeah, he he at the end his you know final press conference he gave the prediction that they'll win a Big Ten championship soon. With uh, he he named Braden Shrewsbury, I believe that's Mike's kid, um, who's like a pretty like highly yeah, rated prospect. Twenty twenty three recruit. So that that's exciting. Um, that'll be cool. I, and I also feel like that's good. Not that it, that it was an issue, but that's also good security for Shrewsbury. Like he's not going yeah, anywhere yeah. if his kid is you know going to come through. And I, I know he's balling at State High right now. Um. But yeah, OS covered was awesome of basketball, by the way. Keely and Connor, you guys both killed it, among some other people covering basketball. So thank you guys for that. The games were very fun to watch, definitely, and our uh, coverage helped that. Yeah, we appreciate A little self-plug, yeah. <laughs> uh, moving on to men's hockey. They were also in the Big Ten tournament this weekend. They upset Ohio State, actually, in a three-game series. Did you guys catch any of that? I did not. I um so Charlie and I at home were trying to watch because it was on like BTN Plus and I know I don't really know how that works now how you get like a free account yeah. mm-hmm. but we couldn't we couldn't figure it out so I wasn't watching but I was following along with our tweets actually seems awesome I mean if we beat Ohio State in anything I'm excited you know what I mean sure. so I'm not a huge hockey guy just knowing the rules and that kind of thing but it super fun that's that's awesome good for them and good for uh, I know somebody wrote us I think Frankie Marzano wrote a story about how you know Guy Gadowski like gets everything out of them even. You know, despite them being maybe having a less than stellar season and maybe some newer, younger players, they managed to make a pretty deep run. And I mean, beating Ohio State's a big deal and hanging with Minnesota. Yeah, it seems like they always win when it matters. And yep. obviously, they moved into the semifinals against number one Minnesota. 
They fell three to two, but Minnesota is the number two team in the country. So Dylan Lugris and Tyler Paquette both scored, but that game was not a series, so that ended the the year for the Nittany Lions. So hopefully, there's big things to come next year. Uh, they have a pretty good recruiting class coming in, so it should be exciting to see what Penn State does on the ice. For sure. Up. Maybe and maybe if Minnesota were a series, they would have they would have managed to pull it out. Maybe yeah, that is true. Reconsider that know. structure, NCAA. What the hell. <laughs> Uh, moving uh, on to women's hockey, they haven't played since February 25th. That's when they fell to Mercyhurst 4-2 to in the College Hockey America tournament. But this weekend, the Frozen Four is coming to the Pagula Ice Arena. Are you guys planning on going at all? I will be at wrestling, that's so I'm not, but that's pretty That's pretty sick. I mean, the Frozen Four is a big deal. Yeah, I, I, I will not be there, but there are some pretty cool games, it seems. Uh, Northeastern plays Minnesota Duluth on Friday at 3.30, and then Ohio State will play Yale at 7 p.m. on Friday. And then two days after that, the national championship will be at Pagula on Sunday, March 20th at 4 p.m. So pretty cool for the for State College area. I was just going to say, I mean, that's an awesome facility, right? As far as college hockey rinks go, I mean, Pagula, I think, is One up of there. The best, probably. Yeah. yeah, so that's pretty cool. That's exciting for Penn State for sure. And maybe um, if you want to go to that Yale game, root on Yale. Why not, you know, see Ohio State lose, yeah. <laughs> right? Course. I mean, like, that never hurts, like we just said, so. Good cool. stuff. Moving into spring sports, we have men's lacrosse. How are they doing this season, guys? Do you guys? Men's lacrosse um, just dropped a really tight game to number four Cornell um, on March 12th. Despite three goals each from Jeb Breadfleck and Ethan Long, um, the Nittany Lions just couldn't put it together. Um, and then they lost again today, Tuesday, to Bucknell. Another tight loss, 12-11. to um, Fifth-year senior Jack Kelly grabbed three goals, but they couldn't make the comeback in the end. I know. I mean, I, two and six record, but obviously that um, the Cornell lost, but they uh, they beat Yale. Am I correct on yep, that? Yeah, number that's, five. That's an awesome upset. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I feel like they've kind of, they kind of, I guess that was before you guys got here, but they kind of peaked. Um, that would have been my freshman year they went to the they went to the final four, final four yeah. and i think they lost to yell then but obviously like grant and Mint and uh mac o'keefe and those guys kind of like revived the program or really started kickstarted the program so i mean two and six record but still i think they're still competing really well and the big ten has kind of randomly become like a powerhouse yeah who knew because john, Hopkins john I, I, I forgot i always forget johns hopkins is a big ten team in lacrosse so i mean i don't know they they compete and the lacrosse games are always fun over at panzer yeah. so cool facility yeah again. Uh, going on to women's lacrosse, they're five and two this season, and they played four games since the beginning of spring break. So we've missed a little with that. Keely, how do they do in those games? Yep, they took three out of the four games. Um, they took on number nine, Loyal, excuse me, Loyola, Maryland. Um, lost that game eighteen to nine. Um, Taylor Regan grabbed three goals, um, but that's a really good team right there. Um, the Nittany Lions then took on JMU here at uh, Panzer and won 14 to 10. Kristen O'Neill grabbed another four goals and Karen Newland had three assists. So that was a big game. That was a ranked JMU squad. Penn State dominated St. Joe's 17 to 8 at home. Uh, three different players each scored three goals en route to a big victory at Holuba. So that was a big game as well. Um, after that game, Kristen O'Neill earned Big Ten Midfielder of the Week, and she put up seven goals and three assists throughout the two pre- previous games against St. Joe's and JMU, so big week for her. And then in their final game of the last two weeks, I guess, the Nittany Lions played Tosin and took down the Tigers 15-6. to Big game. Um, once again, three Nittany Lions each scored three goals, and freshman goalie Ashley Bowman had a big game in the net. Yeah, fi- I mean that's shout out to Missy Missy Doherty. I know she's been there for a while. That's kind of a bounce back year too. I think yeah. they yeah. kind of had a slow year last year. Um, that's awesome that that goalie's a freshman. That's very exciting. Uh, <laughs> a couple more really solid years. No, it's okay. Uh, it's, it's Keely is so excited that she is. So I good. love Ashley Bowen. <laughs> <laughs> so um, checking in on baseball, they also have five wins, but they have nine losses. Uh, tough series against number five Virginia from Charlottesville. Uh, a couple weeks ago on March 4th, so they they were swept in that. And then they stayed in Virginia against VMI in a one-game series that they lost 11-4. to So tough sledding for them. Yep. Uh, they faced off against UMass from Cary, North Carolina. And they won those two games in a three-game series. So I, I don't know. Do you guys have any takeaways from that? College baseball is weird, man. I like – so I like – I feel – because I feel like all the Southern teams are good because they can just play. Yeah. Like, it's like college golf. Medler Field at Lubrano Park. Um, 
like w- w- like they're, they're still shoveling snow off of it. So yeah. I, not to like make excuses, but I feel like it's just hard to like develop a baseball program, especially when your season starts in. I mean, Mart like Mart. I know right now they're playing in the South, but even still, it's hard to like be away from home that long. Well, I don't know. It's so, hard to recruit over SEC yeah, teams. Yeah, yeah. Like, just like who, yeah. Who's why who's wouldn't you want to play baseball at yeah. Vanderbilt or so? Exactly. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> not to immediately be down on Penn State baseball. <laughs> I mean, f- like obviously, I mean UVA is a wagon. Like they're crazy good. Yeah. Then they just won the national championship, but they were in it. Um, and, and they played them tough for one of the games in right. the series. So I, I don't know. I think baseball, a lo- it's a lot like college hockey. How like yeah. they can kind of s- snag a game here and there. Yeah, yeah, with the series, series. Yeah. It's a long season, so we'll see. I, I, I'm a big fan of Rob Cooper's. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Five and nine record isn't a bad start, so you can build on that. I think uh, kind of random, but, like, it would be – imagine one day if Penn State went to Omaha. That'd be crazy. That'd be so the college, cool. The College World Series is sick. We would have to send people down there for oh, sure. Oh, yeah. For sure. Yeah. That'd be that'd be really – but so we'll see. Maybe they'll uh, they'll get it together. But, um, yeah, wish them luck throughout the rest of the season. Obviously, geez, 56 game schedule, so it's a grind. That's definitely a grind, but it seems fun. I mean, baseball's fun. Uh, moving on to the women's side of things, we have softball. They're 10 and 11 right now, which is pretty solid. Just a game below 500. Uh, the Nittany Lions played in two showcases in the last two weeks, including the Carolina Classic in Chapel Hill and the Delaware Invitational, which was oddly in Newark. <laughs> um, but they picked up one win over UNC, and then they lost four other games. Uh, how did that play out, Keely? Yep, the Nittany Lions dropped to a ranked Oregon team, UConn, and both of their games against UNC Greensboro. Um, after they closed out that showcase, they headed to Duke, um, grabbed another loss over there, unfortunately, in the before heading back to Newark for the Delaware Invitational. Um, Penn State then split games against Delaware, and its final game was canceled before the girls headed back to Happy Valley. So their next game is against Pitt on March 16th. That's an away game. So good luck to them. Yeah, I always want to grab one over Pitt. Uh, yeah, always. In anything. I have a lot of friends that are that go to Pitt, so there you, go. If you guys are watching this. You guys are going down on March 16th. <laughs> um, me and Charlie's aunt played soft- softball at UNC Greensboro. I just realized that. Kelly played Kelly played softball there, yeah, yeah. Wow. in high school, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's really random. Sorry, guys, but yeah, shout out uh, Kelly Pegler, uh, my dad's <laughs> little sister. Anyway, yeah, shout out to the softball team, ten and eleven. I mean, that's that's a strong start. Again, I feel like it's like as long as you're around five hundred in the early going, like who yeah, knows what could sure. happen, sure. you know? I actually I saw them. Uh, I was, at, I was at the IM building. No big deal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. But I saw them. I saw them uh, shoveling snow off of the softball fields. That's exciting. Getting some games in yeah. at Penn State finally. Spring's right? coming. I know, right? Spring fever. So that's all we have for sports. Uh, thank you guys. We're gonna wrap it up. So thank you, Keely and Will. Thanks, dude. Thank you guys. See ya. See ya. All right. That was another episode of Podward State. We talked to Trace McSorley. Did some headlines. Talked sports. It's a good episode. What'd you think? Hey, it was great. Had a f- great time talking to Trace McSorley. Mm-hmm. Um, appreciate him staying on the staying on the line with us. Mm-hmm. Um, we lost him in the beginning. We did lose him actually at the beginning. I don't know if we're gonna be able to like have that in there. I, we might cut that out. But if you guys see it, that's what happens. That's come here. Um, we have in the studio with me and Grace. We have uh, Haley Stotsman, our editor. You can walk around and show everybody. We have our sound technician, Jordan Mansberger. We have associate producer, William Hutchinson Pegler III. <laughs> Shout out Jack Peggs. We got Tegan Stoudenmire. I can't see who are you on. Keely. We got Keely Lamb. We got Connor Krause getting his first sports host today. We got uh, <laughs> sister Shannon <laughs> Shannon Smith. Hey, stop. Oh my gosh! Shannon's stop. shy. Yeah, Shannon's the most shy person in the world. <laughs> and then we got uh, Charlie Pegler back. Um, Charlie getting his first headlines host. Uh, yeah, everyone mean. except for Mara. Um, shout out Mara McKeon. Is she related to Jackie? <laughs> stop saying that. Um, the joke is dead. Shout out Jackie McKeon. Um, we are gonna miss Will on Friday at the Brew, and also. Um, uh, Gabe Herman. Gabe Herman's kind of a staple of my Brew Fridays. He's what? Gabe will be here. Oh, shout out Gabe will be at wrestling. Why? Uh, we'll talk about it later. Um, <laughs> but shout out to the crew. Um, will, I hope you and Mara have safe travels. And Aaron. And Aaron. Oh,
Yeah. No, uh, we hope Aaron people. has, and has buddy, bad travels. You're going too, right, bud? Yeah. Buddy? Yeah, yeah bull. Um, anyways, we're going to wrap here. We're here. It's 8.16 and 12 Late seconds. Um, we're still going to leave and it's going to be dark even though. It's March. Even though daylight savings. 14th. 2022. No, it's the 15th. March 15th, 2022. Yeah, Anyways, uh, we're back after spring break. Podcation. Podcation, our second of the year. I think it's the third. I've said podcation like a bunch of times. Well, we had one last season. Or maybe I maybe I, I talk about the podcation before it happens and then after. Yeah. Second of the season. Shout out. A couple shout outs. Shout out Pat Chambers, FGCU, friend of the show. Shout out. We had so many shout outs. Uh, uh, Brenneman, mm-hmm. we had Brandon Bell, shout out. Adam Talaferro, shout out. There was one Tommy other. Tommy Stevens. Tommy Stevens, shout out. So, shout out to all our friends. Our friends. We have so many friends all now. Our, all our buddies. Friend of the show, Trace McSorley. We need That's oh, got a nice we keep, ring to we it. We keep forgetting stickers. Anyways, maskless, as Yay. always, from the Willard Building, but now it's legally maskless. Yay. From the Willard <laughs> Building, this is Podward State. My name is Sam Brungo. I'm Grace Cunningham. We appreciate you guys. Be safe. Have a good weekend. Adios. Or week, actually. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. Do it again. Bye.